Good afternoon. Uh, we are going to begin. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and welcome to the second of this week's three Rosenbach lectures on printing abolition by Michael Suarez, director of Rare Book School and university professor at the University of Virginia. My name is Sean Quimby. I'm Penn Libraries Associate University Librarian for Special Collections and Director of the Kislak Center. Before we get started, I would like to share a few housekeeping items uh, with you first. Uh, to mark Professor Suarez's lectures, Penn Press, one of our key partners in organizing the Rosenbox, is extending discounts on books relating to the study of material texts. Our in-person audience has already seen the table in front of the elevators and our online audience can visit the link that we have just shared in the chat. Thank you. Uh, second, I wanna remind you that Professor Suarez will be leading an informal open seminar featuring rare material germane to the lectures that he's giving this week tomorrow from 10 a.m. to noon in Lee Library. There's no need to register in advance for that. Third, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Rosenbach Committee, uh, chaired by David McKnight and comprised of the eminent scholars that Constantia named yesterday for selecting Professor Suarez to speak. I'd also like to thank Lynn Farrington, Kislak's Director of Programs and Senior Curator, and all of the staff here at Penn Libraries for helping to make this hybrid event a success. I've just learned that we had 220 people online last night, which is fantastic. Last night's lecture focused on how the abolitionist movement took shape around the very particular issue of the slave trade and how that movement looked to print and in particular the distribution of printed pamphlets and treatises to enlist allies with access to the halls of power. This evening, Professor Suarez will consider the political economies of print in the colonial world. And few people are better equipped to set the scene for us than Emma Hart. Emma is the Richard S. Dunn Director of the McNeil Center for Early American Studies and Professor of History. Born in Edinburgh, she studied at Oxford and the University of Manchester's Sotheby's Institute before working as a tracer of stolen art and antiques. Emma, I hope you'll join us for our December symposium <laughs> on the ethics of collecting in the 21st century. And then taking her PhD at, the, at Johns Hopkins University. She's the author of many scholarly articles and two monographs, including 2019's Trading Spaces, The Colonial Marketplace and the Foundations of American Capitalism, in which she argues that the period Professor Suarez is considering in his lectures constituted a key moment in economic history when the market became more than a physical space, but an abstract concept, a shift that would have major consequences for the American economy. And perhaps I might interject for the context in which abolitionist print matter would circulate. So please join me in welcoming Emma Hart. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sean, for the um, introduction. And thank you, Lynn, for inviting me to do this uh, introduction to Michael's second lecture. Um, I just wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about Michael's work from the perspective of an 18th century historian and uh, material culture scholar, um, and also someone who recently moved from an institution, St. Andrews University, where the history of the book is at the center of many things uh, that, 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 were done, that are done there. Um, I mean, I, so I know Michael as, as being at the forefront um, for a long time on multiple fronts of the, the history of the book. Um, he uh, is, is instrumental, of course, in writing about the history of the book, uh, of training people in the history of the book and helping them to understand the, the implications of its, of its materiality at the rare book school that um, is held every year at the University of Virginia about, which I had not, which I have not attended, but which I have heard about its brilliance from many colleagues over the years. Um, he is, uh, of course, written uh, abundantly about the 18th century and 19th century history of publishing, printing, book selling. Um, and he's also uh, seized opportunities um, of, of, of the digital humanities to create really innovative uh, and useful online resources like the Oxford scholarly editions 
online, which he's been at work on since 2010, I believe, and which is a really monumental uh, collection, a sort of one-stop shop for uh, editions of any author that one might uh, want to look for. So when I first started um, a recent project on Tobias Smollett, it was the first place I went to have a look at to to Tobias Smollett's collected works and letters. And it's a really uh, fantastic um, and, and uh, extensive resource, which is still growing. Um, and it is, you know, all of this work uh, that has also meant that, that Michael, who, who um, just told me this this afternoon, will next year be the inaugural guest professor for at the University of Chicago um, in, the, in its visiting scholar program in paleography uh, and the history of the book. So another very well-deserved uh, accolade. But of course, um, it's the contributions uh, of his current project, which are closest to my interests uh, as an 18th century historian with material preoccupations. Um, and also I'm someone who, who, you know, my interests have straddled the British Atlantic world as Michael's do as well. This is, his approach is impressive because it, it genuinely looks at both sides of the Atlantic, at Britain and America in a true relationship of uh, circulation and, uh, and, and interchange between people on, on both sides um, of the ocean. And listening to his, his lecture yesterday made me not only eagerly await uh, his lectures today and Thursday, but um, it also uh, struck me as being very innovative in terms of 18th century history in a number of ways. And I just wanted to talk a bit about those before I hand over to Michael for his lecture today. Um, as Chris Brown noted in his not, not so old book, uh, Moral Capital, it really wasn't until a few decades ago that historians actually asked how abolition happened. Um, and so what Michael is doing is really explaining the nuts and bolts of that on the ground with his history of print in a way that historians haven't previously managed to do. And what is particularly impressive to me and noteworthy and exciting is how he reaches beyond London to these provincial networks. And it's, it's, very, uh, it, it's always been in, in the length of my career very noticeable to me how so much British history is still London centric history. And I can't stress enough how innovative Michael's work is to really reach into the provinces and think about the complex dynamics between those provincial networks. Um, and London. And similarly, to really be looking across the Atlantic and looking at the transatlantic networks and putting them together in a kind of multi-directional model, as the print of the slave trip ha ship has allowed him to do, is also uh, really quite astonishing and exciting. Um, so, and, and also to me as someone who's, who's worked, who does social and economic history and has looked at a lot of phenomena like market development on the ground, I think his work also takes us far beyond the usual suspects, as he said yesterday, to look at people like James Phillips, who we might otherwise not have heard of, who often remain obscure. And finally, I think, uh, as, as he noted yesterday, he used this wonderful term in his lecture, um, that print was meant to highlight, quote, the blare of evidence, which I think is a really fantastic term. And it's a salutary reminder, this phrase, uh, of, of how this was a really long and ca hard campaign and how it's really only by getting into the weeds of, of things like print distribution that we can understand how hearts and minds were, were changed. And of course, it wasn't a big jump for me when I was thinking about that to think about uh, current campaign tactics in our modern digital age and to think also about, um, you know, to, to, to think about the differences or similarities between this age in which printed evidence is becoming supremely important to changing minds, to the question of whether we're still in the same place, whether we can go back to that place, and what difference uh, the overwhelming amount of, of not so evidentially firm social media evidence makes to campaigns in our current age. So I'm sure that his lectures today and tomorrow will provoke uh, even more interesting and engaging reflections. And I will hand over to Michael now without, without further ado. Thank you so much, Emma. I really appreciate it, your engagement with the material. 
uh, what a privilege to be with you this afternoon. 300,000. 300,000 is the common estimate of the number of men and women, not counting children, who gave up sugar and rum because of its association with the slave trade in the United Kingdom in 1790, 91, 92. 300,000 souls, it's a lot of people. How did it happen? Today, I'd like to talk about print culture and the mediation that print affords in uh, England, Scotland, Wales, a little bit um, for the making this boycott happen. Like yesterday, the subject that I'm trying to engage with has been very well studied and the body of scholarship is deep and rich. But I wondered if perhaps we could learn something new by engaging very closely with the nitty gritty of print production by print production and see if that could yield results. So the anti-saccharites were those who thought that sugar was tainted because of the way it was obtained from the sugar colonies in the West Indies. And, and you can see by late March of 1792, uh, the, the royal household has given up sugar supposedly. And, and you can see the, the daughters are not very pleased with this great moral stance that supposedly the king has taken. And as we go on, more satires on the king as an emblem of the boycott. But the point is, it's, it's in the air. It's part of the regular conversation in the public press. It's become a social phenomenon. So the, the boycott really uh, begins, its association with the principles really begins way before 1791. You can see here in December of 88 that the Baptist church at May's Pond holds a collection for abolition and gives 22 pounds. And then to return the favor, the abolition committee buys 100 pamphlets of that sermon which are promoting the abolition of the slave trade. And um, as you can see, George Phillips and Martha Gurney, who we're gonna hear a lot about, are, are the two main uh, producers and, and sellers of, of this pamphlet. And so, and so this is very, very much a, a pro-abolition pamphlet for the glorious cause of universal liberty. They buy in a hundred, the association between the Mays Pond Church and the abolition committee is a powerful one. This is one of the products of opening up the committee beyond the remit of the Quakers. And Martha Gurney, we read in the biography of her written by her nephew, soon after the diagram of the slave ship came out, put that diagram in her shop window. She wanted everybody to know where her political allegiances lie. So Gurney is already a pro-abolitionist. Gurney is already uh, part of a family of, of printers, part of a family of legal stenographers. And um, her brother is important to the abolitionist cause. He goes into parliament and takes evidence in his special shorthand method uh, uh, developed by his father. And, um, and Martha is the publisher printer of a number of those pamphlets. So, um, uh, in April of 91, after a big petitioning campaign, uh, Wilberforce's motion is crushed in the parliament, not only because of the instability wrought by the French Revolution, but also because of the Haitian Revolution. And the parliament of Great Britain is in no way uh, having an appetite for, for social or political change of any kind. Uh, 
And, and um, uh, here, here we see uh, Mrs. Barbold's poem on the subject, which was, which was widely heralded, but it's a poem about defeat. Um, in the aftermath of, of the testimony that led to the defeat, um, there's more and more about the cruelties of the slave trade in the news as if there wasn't enough already. This is actually a political cartoon about a, an event that was part of testimony in before the House of Commons. And so this barbarities in the West Indies, the, the actual text down below is taken from parliamentary testimony. And, and the, the abolition committee, which we saw yesterday and we'll be seeing intermittently today, uh, I, I accuse that committee of being deeply conservative and their conservatism is evident today as well. Unfortunately, they say, um, look, you know, we lost the vote, but, um, but this is terrible, this is murder. And we call on everyone who feels for the honor of his country to assist in hastening the abolition uh, of the trade. We cannot persuade ourselves that pr the propriety of the West India Islands prosperity depends on the misery of Africa or that the luxuries of rum and sugar can only be obtained by tearing asunder those ties of affection which unite our species and exalt our nature. They don't outright say there should be a boycott, but this is as close as they're going to come. And it's important. This is late April of 91. So um, sometime thereafter, uh, probably in early summer, we see the appearance of this pamphlet anonymously written by William Fox and jointly published by Phillips and Gurney, Martha Gurney and James Phillips. So they, they come together on this pamphlet addressed to the people of Great Britain. It's a 12 mo half sheet, cheap, fast to produce. And um, there are some scholarship that indicates that this pamphlet is the most widely circulated pamphlet in the whole of the 18th century, more even perhaps than the rights of man. It's difficult to know, but we'll come back to that. So William Fox in the address to the people of Great Britain uh, again and again says that sugar is tainted and he uses this image of blood over again. Um, they may hold sugar cane to our lips steeped in the blood of our fellow creatures, but they cannot compel us to accept the loathsome potion. Abstain from the use of sugar and rum till we can ob obtain the produce of the sugar cane in some other mode, unconnected with slavery and unpolluted with blood. So there's this idea that the whiteness of the sugar masks immaculate quality, that somehow the sugar is itself a kind of maculatum, a stain, a moral stain, but also a kind of a physical stain. Um, in every pound of sugar used, the produce of slaves imported from Africa, we may be considered as consuming two ounces. He does this elaborate calculation of human flesh. And there's a kind of a bodily calculus throughout this little pamphlet um, that, that is designed to appall and in some case revolt the readers of this to engender the, the boycott. So, um, so this pamphlet runs and runs and runs and um, the constant through its publishing history is Martha Gurney, as you can see, for all the London editions through 1791 and 92. Now, it happens to be the case that, not, and not my scholarship, the scholarship of another, that Martha Gurney is the domestic partner of William Fox. And so it doesn't hurt 
if the author is your domestic partner. But there's much more to it than that. Martha Gurney is the most prolific woman bookseller of the second half of the 18th century in England. And it's a shame that she's not better known, although there is some very good extant scholarship that's come out in the last few years about her. So um, when, we see, when we see here, typically the, this is um, Cooper's Negro's complaint becomes part of this. And um, there's always some kind of statement about you can buy them in bulk and distribute them. Very important aspect of this. Um, the provincial editions are a bibliographical nightmare in some sense. I mean, because they don't know what the order of editions really is. There are three sixth editions. They have no idea, right? There are several ninth editions. There are, you know, there's a ninth edition in 92 and a ninth edition in 91. Well, Boston, Boston has no idea where they are in the, in the order here. But the point is that this is getting out transatlantically. The point is, is that this is being published provincially as well. It's a 12-mo half sheet or an octavo half sheet. It's, it's easy to produce, it's cheap to produce, and um, it runs and runs and runs. So um, it also benefits from an early phenomenon equivalent to being banned in Boston. A woman apologist for slavery comes after the pamphlet hard. And the novelty of her being a woman author and her being pro-slavery occasions a torrent of replies against her. How could a woman who's supposed to embody compassion be a pro-slavery advocate? And that gets more and more people, she attacks the pamphlet. And that's good for business because when the pamphlet is attacked, more people know about it. And when more people know about it, it's a, it's a penny pamphlet. They get the pamphlet, they read the pamphlet, they circulate the pamphlet and so on. So um, it's also true that this begins to hit the newspapers in the fall of 91. Uh, this is my, my favorite instance in the Bath Chronicle in which the, the uh, writer says, look, there's a chain of slavery. And it starts with the seizing of slaves in Africa, and it ends when you put that sugar in your tea. And we've tried really hard to take the first part of the chain away and stop the system. And it hasn't worked. So now let's go to the other end of the chain and not put that sugar in our tea. Let's break the chain where we can. Um, and, and so this, the boycott's becoming more, more popular. It's also true, um, uh, last time we talked about Cuguano, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about Equiano, whose book in contrast is a runaway bestseller. It, it's published entirely by subscription. He controls the production and dissemination and he keeps the profits. He goes on the road for six years to sell his book by subscription, and he does very well indeed. It's not often acknowledged, however, because the actual narrative never advocates for a boycott, and the boycott is an evolved, the narrative is changed over time a little bit. And because he never advocates outright for the abolition of the slave trade in his narrative, I think he's learned from Kugoano and, and that people were allergic to his radical stance, albeit a highly moral one. So he is a primary, Equiano is a primary distributor of abolition pamphlets. And we know in 91, he's in Sheffield and he starts to give out copies of the address. He starts to distribute Fox's pamphlet. He's traveling around, he's gathering crowds. They're curious to see a black man in the provinces. He's a very good public speaker. He's an extremely affable human being. He has great charisma and he uses that to distribute abolition literature, including from mid 91 forward, 
the sugar pamphlet, the boycott pamphlet. And so, and so he's on the road all the time. And I think we underestimate the power of, of what Equiano very likely was able to do. And, and he becomes kind of an establishment figure for the abolition of the slave trade, um, except for the committee won't officially endorse him. But members of the committee endorse him, including Clarkson, in, including the, the uh, more radical Manchester abolitionists and so on. And, and his subscription list grows and grows and grows and even includes members of the royal family, even attracts things like uh, Atkinson and Huddersfield, who's so taken with Equiano that he subscribes for 100 copies. It doesn't mean he took 100 copies, but he's running a coal mine in Huddersfield. Uh, he's an he's a industrialist, and he says, uh, put me down for the price of 100 copies. It's a form of patronage, right? So he's gaining patronage, and he's distributing pamphlets. And um, this is part of the boycott. A black man is going around and saying over and again, the boycott is a good thing. I lived slavery. This will cut it off. That becomes very important. Hard to, we don't have a lot of testimony about that, but we have some. It's also true that I'd like to problematize briefly traditional accounts of when the boycott starts by going back to Otoba Cuguano and saying, if you read the text, you find out that he says, uh, you're eating sugar, it would be better to sip the West India sweetness by paying a little more money for it if it should be found needful than to drink the blood of iniquity at a cheaper rate. I know several ladies in England who refuse to drink sugar in their tea because of the cruel injuries to black people. So by July of 87, Kuango is associating sugar consumption with drinking blood. So when Southie in 95 and Sonnet 3 on the slave trade calls it tea, the blood sweetened beverage, He's not doing anything that Kuguano wasn't doing in 87, thank you very much. And the blood imagery that Fox is using may, it's hard to know, may come from his reading of Kuguano, it seems to me, possibly. But it's also true that English women are abstaining from sugar because of the cruelties of slavery in the summer of 87, not in the fall of 91. So there's already a nascent movement, it seems to me. And, and that, that's important for thinking about the way we try to document these things. It's also true that grocers begin to take a moral stance. This is the most famous instance. While I am a dealer in that article, West Indian Sugar, I am encouraging slavery and I'm not gonna sell sugar anymore, he says, until we can get until we can, we can get East Indian sugar, which will be uh, not tainted, so-called free sugar as opposed to slave sugar. This becomes really important movement, and there's been some kind of tacit criticism of members of the abolition societies who bought stock in East Indian sugar plantations as this movement was kind of coming on. So um, an interesting thing about were they trying to benefit from a moral stance or not. But um, you see this idea about it being polluted with human blood comes right from Fox. And, and the grocer has taken this on and posted this, this handbill to notify his customers. It's also true that our own, as it were, Philadelphian Benjamin Rush um, publishes a pamphlet that gets reprinted by Mirabile Dictu, James Phillips, about using, the, using maple sugar instead of using uh, tainted West Indian sugar. And um, you can see here, he says, Mr. Jefferson uses no other sugar in his family. Oh, irony of ironies, it seems to me. 
Um, it's also true that uh, the site of sugar consumption was very much the domestic ritual of the tea table, as well as, as baking, the running of the kitchen, and um, the, the bringing in of comestibles, and then consuming them at family meals and at tea. And knowing this, we see a subject for conversation and reflection at the tea table. Here is a little discussion. Here is Cooper's poem. Slavery depends upon the consumption of the produce of its labor and for support. Refuse this produce and slavery must cease. And so here is this um, piece of print aimed at the domestic sphere. And Clarkson in the history of the abolition of the slave trade says that Cooper uh, wrote this poem, he thought of it, we printed it on wove paper, we folded it up in neat form, call it subject for conversation at the tea table, and um, we sent out many thousand copies. Again, the distribution is so very crucial. We sent out many thousand copies in francs. And then this became a kind of a, a set subject, as it were, for the site of domestic consumption, principally controlled by women. Please understand women were not allowed to sign the petitions that were sent to parliament. Women were not given, of course, the franchise. And by voting with the ability not to buy West Indian tainted sugar, they were given a measure of autonomy, a measure of say, the vote, the political mechanism failed. Wilberforce lost badly, but they could maybe, just maybe, through their domestic agency as consumers, they could vote. They could vote with their money. They could vote with the conduct of their household. And I think this is very important. And I think that the, the uh, appeal of this should not be underestimated. Um, and of course, there's a strong urge, there's a hortatory aspect to this, that you can be part of a great campaign. So there's not one version of this, there are multiple versions of this because of the canon that print always breathes print. And so here we see another instantiation. This has not one Cooper poem, but three Cooper poems. And I think we go from simplicity probably toward increasing complexity. Uh, the boycott language stays the same, but there's more poetry for discussion. There's more poetry for inculcating a sense of moral urgency. And um, please, please notice, uh, it's printed in such a way that it can be folded up in a kind of letter locking system, which many of you know more about than I do, but also so that you can write notes. You can write a note, you can personalize it and send it to someone and say, please consider this when you gather with your family and friends, please make your choice, make a moral choice. So I think this is really important. And there are other versions too. This one here, The Negro's Complaint by William Cooper, but without any of the accompanying uh, uh, framing device, but still printed in a pretty elegant way and, um, and circulated, I think, fairly widely. So uh, we see in the Ken Kentish Gazette in late October, anti oppressio is as, yes, I know, not very, he didn't have a great command of romance languages, but, but um, he's saying you can do this if you abstain from the contaminated produce of the West India Islands, we can do this and this will be a blessing. This is a moral kind of crusade and I don't think we should lose that aspect. So um, it's also true that when we, when we think about how, how, um, 
this idea runs, we have to start to look at print productions that are never canonical, but are nonetheless are, are I think, central to the development. Um, uh, you can see here a kind of a, a, a profound moral argument. A French writer observes it's stained with the spots of human blood. And Dr. Franklin says, and the adducing of the argument from authority here runs. And um, also we, we, get, we get print productions like this. Considerations on the slave trade and the consumption of West Indian produce, uh, 1791. Uh, the imprint is not gonna tell you who made it, but I'll bet dollars to donuts that it's actually Phillips himself here. And then who publishes this, who's part of the second edition? here, Darnton and Harvey, who are part of the boycott team who are publishing Fox's pamphlet. So this is early October 91. And this is a kind of a concatenation of Thomas Cooper, the Manchester abolitionists, letters on slavery, which are very powerful and deserve to be studied, I believe, and the address to the inhabitants of Great Britain on the abstaining from sugar and rum. So in other words, this gets reprinted over and again in different forms, often in texts that are a mashup of the, the sort of greatest hits of various abolition pamphlets digested in such a way that you can just buy one cheap pamphlet and get, as it were, the Reader's Digest version. So, and also this kind of breaking news at the end of it, um, uh, numbers have given up at Norwich and Yarmouth and um, a grocer at Hackney, we just saw him, has, has left off the, the uh, selling of sugar. And, um, and this is even going in, in, in France. So this idea is, look, this is a phenomenon. This is a wave and you need to catch the wave. You need to be part of it. Now we know about consumer behavior that if you say to people in the hotel, you should, you should reuse your towels because it's good for the planet, almost nobody does. But if you say 75% of our guests reuse their towels because they care about the future of our planet and you should join these people who are part of this important cause, the majority of people sign on. And that's what's happening, it seems to me, in the boycott. There's, there's a constant um, chorus of, of saying, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. More and more people are getting on the, on the wagon here. You should do it too. Um, some people are so enthusiastic or trying to profit from this. It's a bit hard to know that um, we find this, this very strange G. Terry eighth edition in London where you, you can pay a subscription and you get a certain number of copies here and um, he's added Cooper, <laughs> he's added some more Cooper to it because just for, for value added, it's a bit, it's a bit longer. But um, George Terry's not Martha Gurney. George Terry's not, uh, not um, uh, Phillips. He's, he's, not, uh, he's, he's, actually, he's actually a printmaker. He's a banknote engraver. He works for the Bank of England. Um, and, and so what's he doing publishing this pamphlet? Is it an act of philanthropy or is it an act of profiteering? It's very hard to know. Um, I, I haven't been able to find a lot of, of data about him, but he seems to have been a philanthropist and therefore I'm going to assume the best of him. So it's also true that these, there are provincial editions that just appear because some local wealthy person bought into this. Here's a good example. Um, printed in the year 1791, we wanted to reprint this. We think this is important. Terrible paper, okay press work, cheap thing to put out, make a thousand, make 2000 copies, flood your local area, do your part. And the thing is, this is small enough, this is cheap enough, this is manageable enough that even the lowliest provincial 
printer can take this on. And I think that's an important aspect of this. Here you see one that I, I, I don't know quite how to interpret. This is another provincial printing, this time in Hull, dated 1791. And who is the MP for Hull who won't publicly accept the boycott? Oh, a guy named William Wilberforce. Right, because he's too afraid of rocking the boat because everybody's timid because the French Revolution is on. Everybody's timid because of the slave revolt in, in, in Saint-Domingue, right? And so he, he won't do this. And they, they go right into his backyard and they publish, <laughs> they publish the boycott pamphlet. It's hard to read the register of that. Is this an act of defiance? Is this an act of persuasion? Is this somehow tacitly licensed by Wilberforce? Did Wilberforce even perhaps pay for this? It's, we, can't, we can't really know. Then we get the, the reprinting. This is again, this kind of concatenation of pamphlets uh, printed for a society. Um, and this is in, in Seven Oaks in Kent. In Kent. And um, I, I wonder if it's, there is a Seven Oaks, um, there is a Seven Oaks subscriber in that list we saw from 1788, who may be the, the factor behind it. But it's also true that in Teston, just 20 miles from Seven Oaks, there is a whole important society of abolitionist intellectuals who may well have been behind the editing and production of this pamphlet. When we think about the reach of Fox's ideas, we cannot restrict ourselves to the agency of Gurney and her associates, important as she is. We need to countenance that fully, but we also need to understand the degree to which many, many individuals are taking this on themselves with no authorization from any local abolition committee and saying this is our next expedient. We need to take on this expedient because the parliamentary expedient has failed. And so now it's time for our agency to come to the fore. So here you see a reprinting of the Seven Oaks pamphlet in, 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 in Chester. Now it's 200 miles as the crow flies and a lot further by some really bad roads. How does this tiny, pretty insignificant, concatenation of two pamphlets end up in Cheshire from Kent. Um, print travels, print travels, maybe traveled by the post, maybe traveled by somebody who put it in a coach, maybe, but whoever got it in, in Chester decided to reprint it. And that seems to me really interesting. We should also remember that the survival rates of these pamphlets is going to be low, low, low. These provincial productions are not going to survive in significant numbers, if at all. You will remember, of course, Roger Stoddard's law. Bigger books linger longer, little books last least. Well, these are single sheet pamphlets. These are the littlest books, and they last least. And they have a temporal aspect, so they are going to become martyrs of pies and relics of the bum, as Mr. Dryden said. So, um, so it seems to me that probably the surviving historical record does not reflect the full nature of, of what was actually taking place. And again, that may be important for us to countenance. If one starts to go through the newspapers, we see it's the boycott is in the papers over and over again with quite a distribution. Some of the papers are just more pro boycott than others and they keep it to the fore, but many of the newspapers wanna make sure that they've got this in the news and that matters, I think, a great deal. If it's in your weekly provincial newspaper every week, it's a thing. If it's a thing, what are you going to do about it? So it's also true that uh, in, in uh, Coachmakers Hall, 
there, there are a, a cascade, a sequence of debates, not about the slave trade, but about abstinence from sugar and rum as a means for abolishing the slave trade. And we can document those pretty well through the London newspapers. And when we do, we see that it's quite, quite an iterative process. And this, of course, is something else. Uh, we were, I was asked yesterday about the oral culture. Well, here's, here are these men meeting in Cultsmaker Hall debating the merits of abstinence. Obviously, they don't want to give up their rum, but they also don't want to have the slave trade. So that seems important to me. Fox goes on to publish a summary view of the evidence. And of course, it's sold by Gurney. And here's the, here's the infomercial for Gurney's now bestseller. Hey, there have been 50,000 of these sold in about four months. You can get them at Gurney's. Now, here's the question. Many historians have taken the statements of Gurney, 50,000, 70,000, uh, these run and run and run at face value. Hard to know the degree to which this is a generative tactic for saying everybody's doing it and you should be too, or whether it's an actual mirror of what's taking place. I submit to you that probably the prudent course in weighing historical evidence of this kind is to take a middle way. It's probably not entirely only exaggeration. She didn't sell 10,000 and say 50,000, but, but 50 may be more than, than what's actually taken place. So, um, uh, in, in the new pamphlet, the second production of Fox, uh, may he not justly say that the injuries he receives at the hands of his murderous oppressors must be placed to our account and that the blood of him and his unhappy posterity will be required at our hands. So again, this idea that the slave trade will call you to account and the, invo the uh, invocation of the blood imagery is, um, I think, quite deliberate. This is a remarkable piece of print, probably double set, although I haven't been able to find another, another uh, one to check, uh, or, and I would need multiple ones. This is a circular letter, almost certainly printed by James Phillips privately for Thomas Clarkson in January of 92. January 92, and he says, um, look, there's a boycott on, and you've got to get on board. Uh, we can see um, it's a great auxiliary in disposing the minds of such persons towards our cause as we ourselves should never have reached. I think he's talking partly about the power of the domestic sphere there, but, but not exclusively. And he goes on to say, fix upon some bookseller or shopkeeper in your town or neighborhood and have him order a thousand of Fox's pamphlet. There's that provincial printing taking place more and, and again. And then he's very careful to say, do not write at the request of the committee merely as an individual. Clarkson doesn't want to get thrown out of the abolition committee for acting on his own and seeming to be acting as if he were representing the whole committee. But the tactic that he's following, this circular letter, is, is very much what he and Sharp have been doing for, for four years now, for five years. So it's quite interesting. And then he says very clearly, 7,000 of the above, so now it's January of 92, and he's saying the, the address to the people of Great Britain on abstaining from sugar and rum, 70,000 have been distributed. And by the way, we're gonna try to get some petitions going and you should help. Um, this is remarkable. It's also true that James Phillips becomes the the, the, the node again for the correspondence. 
So um, we see people respond. We return to Catherine Plimley, the, the abolitionist herself and the, the sister of Joseph Plimley. And um, my brother has desired Mr. Eddowes, the local bookseller, to print 500 of these. So we haven't found a trace of these, but you see the point. There's all this provincial printing that we can't account for, but we know took place. Um, interestingly, William Allen, a Quaker, takes it on himself to produce his own speech at Coachmakers Hall, where we just saw all these debates were taking place. Um, interestingly, the first edition and the second edition is the same setting of type, um, but the price has been cut in half. So I'm not really sure what to make of that. Does he want wider distribution? Was it left standing in type because it sold a lot? Is the price been cut because it ran big? Is the price been cut because it ran low? We, we can't know, uh, we, we, we can't really know. Both are rational responses, but it goes from, from a tuppenny pamphlet to a penny pamphlet, and it's, it's, it's impossible to really know quite how to read that. But we're, we're in January of 92. This is the kind of um, liminal moment in, in the boycott, it seems to me. And um, Dixon on that tour to Scotland, also from the diary that we were looking at yesterday, diary in the Friends House Library on Euston Road in London. Um, he says that many people over the whole kingdom have wished well to our cause and, and they've been brought to us through the sugar pamphlet. And he starts to distribute the abstract of the evidence, remember from yesterday, and the sugar pamphlet, the abstract of the evidence and the sugar pamphlet. And um, I think it's no accident that the vivification, if you will, of the Planters Publication Committee in January of 92 happens right here when all the anti-sugar pamphlets are hitting the market. And, and it seems to me that this is, it's not just abolitionist arguments. They were, they were formally convoked um, in 88, but they never met. And then this minute book starts in January of 92, and they say, we need to be a countervailing force. We need to fight the abolition of the slave trade. We're the West India planters. We're pro-slavery. We're pro-sugar colonies. We're pro-sugar. And this will be the subject of my talk on Thursday, how that committee operated um, to, to see how they're responding to to what's been printed and also how they're publishing um, new things that the abolition committee will have to deal with uh, and, and others too. But I think this January, 19 January of 92, uh, they, they need to do something. They don't like what's happening in the public press and in these pamphlets at all. So um, the committee itself, the London Abolition Committee, says let's print 5,000 copies of a short sketch of the evidence and let's circulate them, but they don't circulate it with any formal endorsement. So they use their capital to be part of the, of the boycott. They use their capital to continue their education program, but they don't put their name on it. And, and um, we can think about that or, or not. So William Bell Crafton, um, who many people thought wrote the pamphlet that, that Fox actually wrote for a long time. Many library catalogs still attribute the address to the people of Great Britain to William Bell Crafton, not by him at all, it's by, it's by William Fox. Um, but, but you can see this, this which recycles again the Gurney pamphlet, the Fox uh, ideas, this, this uh, starts out in a local production in Tewkesbury, which is Crafton's hometown. Then it's published clandestinely by the abolition committee. Then it's expanded, it's published um, by James Phillips, presumably the London committee's behind that again. Then it has a provincial publication. Then it has, a, again, with the committee, and then it has a Philadelphia instantiation as well. And this is another kind of a, of a recycling. Um, 
Ernie gets involved in the third edition of a short sketch. And of course, um, it's advertising the address to the people of Great Britain. There's a kind of virtuous cycle here. Every print object that comes out of Gurney's shop is, is chronicling the efflorescence of, of the, the, the address to the people of Great Britain on the necessity, propriety, utility, the title changes a little bit of abstaining from sugar and rum. And this is how, this is how, um, this is how this gets advertised over and over again. There's a kind of Ouroboros mentality to the way the print keeps, keeps coming. Um, it's also true that the historical record has been modified. 1792, French Revolution is going on. The slave revolt, Haitian Revolution, is going strong, people are scared. Wedgwood writes to Clarkson. He knows Clarkson's sentiment. He writes to Clarkson. And fortunately, we have Wedgwood's letters as edited by his great niece, I think. And here he says, um, I agree with you that the good effects could happen from general distribution of the address on the consumption of West India sugar and rum. And I've been thinking of an addition to this pamphlet, which might help. Let's put the kneeling slave and let's, let's run with this. I'll help pay for it. That's what the letter says. It's not at all what the letter says. His niece or grandniece, great niece has edited out yeah, I agree with the good effects. And I write to Gurney by this evening post for a thousand of them. I've been speaking with the booksellers in Newcastle on the subject, not, not the big Newcastle, uh, the small Newcastle, on the subject of dispersing them by hawkers. But it, there's not, the money's not going to work exactly, but we're going to try to make it play. And um, I'm going to try to get other people, I'm going to get my friends to do the same thing. It's an astonishing thing that, that, that he's, he's trying to find a financially expedient way to disseminate the pamphlet himself and to get others to do the same. It's not, ladies and gentlemen, it's not anywhere in the published letters of Josiah Wedgwood. That's a remarkable thing, it seems to me, and says something perhaps about the utility of returning to the archive and the importance of places like, like the Kislak Center at the University of Pennsylvania, because the published record might not be the real record. It's also true that we see, we see a, another person say, send me the evidence and the abridgment and the sugar pamphlet, and the evidence and the abridgment and the sugar pamphlet, and the evidence and the abridgment and the sugar pamphlet, right? <laughs> So, so these, these things begin to be associated one with another, whether, whether, whether with William Dixon up in Scotland or, or here near Bradford, um, the sugar pamphlet becomes allied with the abridgment of the evidence as, as um, a, a central tool in, in working for the abolition of the trade and informing people's not just intellect, but moral consciousness. So um, uh, Plimley in her diary quotes a letter uh, and he says, um, this, is, this is in February, late February of 92. And he says, yes, let's, um, let's not use sugar and rum, but the other products we're being told we're hypocrites for not abstaining from other products that could be associated with slave labor, but that's not true because those products will take away English jobs if we stop using them. And we don't wanna damage English jobs. So we'll restrict our boycott to just sugar and rum and not things like cocoa or indigo, which, um, which won't work. So um, here you see, uh, the 24th edition, and we know from Plimley's diary that the 24th edition arrived in Shrewsbury in the West Midlands on March 18th, 
1792. There's no this day is published. So this is an extremely valuable marker to know when the 24th edition actually appears. So the velocity of the pamphlet, as you start to connect the dots, is a truly astonishing thing. Um, it's partly through Gurney's agency, unquestionably, but it's partly through the agency, again, of a whole network that's imbricated in the business of abolition that we need to pay real attention to, it seems to me. Here's a pamphlet that nobody pays any attention to that, again, is part of how the boycott happens, methinks. Considerations address the professors of Christianity on the impropriety, yeah, of consuming sugar and rum, right? Little half sheet octavo. We've seen this before, right? London imprint, no big deal. Well, guess what? In the second edition, who's publishing it? Martha Gurney. Why? Because she becomes the source. She becomes the iconic printer publisher. She becomes the locus for distribution and for the kind of moral center of this boycott. So not just about print, it's about, it's about the courage of a woman printer who stands tall. It's about the courage of a Baptist woman from the Mays Pond congregation who says, I and my fellow believers stand here and you can count us again and again and again. This seems to me very powerful and not necessarily sufficiently attended to that she becomes in many ways, because Fox doesn't have his name on it, right? She becomes in many ways the moral center. And of course, the boycott is aimed in many ways at women. So this, this turns out to be highly felicitous, I think. Here you see third edition in, in Manchester. And um, uh, here you see it runs again in Dublin. They're cheap little half sheet 12 mos. They don't cost anything. You can make them, you can make them go. Uh, they're easy to disseminate. And, and again, now another edition with just this kind of anonymous imprint. Who's behind it? No real way of telling. Um, and, and we get this again. Oh, well, I'm going to create another one of these uh, non pamphlets one of these concatenation pamphlets, and um, the facts are taken from an abstract of the evidence. Oh, and, and thoughts on slavery by, by John Wesley. Oh, and the sugar and rum stuff. Well, that's gonna be from the anonymous pamphlet that we all know about called an address to the people of Great Britain. So this, this almost obsessive reprinting um, in a way that if you just put you know, uh, Fox into ESTC or Gurney into ESTC, you can't find it. You can't find it because the titles are different. You can't find it because the cities are different. You can't find it because the keywords won't tell you it's there. You have to go into the archive and look. And when you look, what do you see? You see this kind of absolute efflorescence of this again and again and again, repackaged, but very much present. So the sugar boycott material is, is, is just a, a paraphrase, which is a paraphrase. Um, and um, here's the summary view of the evidence. And here's the thing. And, and guess what? Who's, who's got the little advertisement at the end? Martha Gurney. So um, this, you know, the, the enormities, the moral enormities of the slave trade continue to be adduced in the public sphere. And, and there's, there's a commercial appetite to know more, a commercial appetite, not just a moral appetite, because there's agency in families. There's, there's a lot of people who are getting more and more interested, what can I do? 300,000 is a lot of people. Uh, there are some estimates that it's 500,000. Um, and East India sugar starts to become more and more popular and more and more of a commercial concern. Very interestingly, in this particular handbill, while the slave trade continues to be, it always must be, while it exists, a soul stain on the legislature and commerce of this country, a soul stain. 
there's there's your maculatum again, which is, sorry? Oh, sorry, foul, oh, it is a foul stain. I'm sorry. You're right, there is the, you're right, it is. I apologize, I, I, I read it incorrectly. Um, thank you, Peter, I appreciate it. Um, so, so here, uh, our, our friend Campbell Halberton, who we saw yesterday, uh, foul stain will do the job too for us, I think, pretty, pr pr pretty, pretty well. Um, but, but here you say, why shouldn't we get the abolition societies to go full on for this? I'm going to try to convince them to do it. And um, his cajoling is not efficacious. Um, very sadly, the London Abolition Committee, which is calling the shots by and large, never actually officially comes on board for the boycott. But, the, but the, the Gurney continues to be the publishing center and she continues in many ways to be the moral center. Here's a sermon on abstaining, Gurney's the publisher. Here's the Methodist, you get, you get Quakers, Baptists, Methodists, they all go to Gurney and they all use her as the clearinghouse. Why? Because she has the connections and because she becomes, her, her imprint becomes a kind of imprimatur, I think, a kind of a moral badge that, uh, uh, that says this is, this, is, this is a legitimate part of the cause. She becomes to the sugar boycott what James Phillips was or is to the production of kind of that mainstream abolitionist print. And then you see here addressed to the Methodists, um, which has been Gurney, and it, and it ends up being distributed, um, of course, in the city chapel, uh, which is a typical Methodist distribution network. And um, this, this, again, without going into great detail, you get the provincial publication, it comes to London, who's going to do it? It's going to be Gurney. And, um, and, and so we can see here that um, when, you, when you eat this, it's not just blood you're going to get, it's also sweat. And so there's this kind of um, obsession with bodily fluids, with effluvia and so on, with contact, which, with that which is unclean. In some ways, this seems kind of racist to me, um, but uh, I, also, I also understand what they're trying to do. Um, interested to know what people think. And, um, and then by 93, Fox continues his career as a political pamphlet. It's difficult to understand the misattribution of the address of the people of Great Britain to uh, William Bell Crafton when you can read a title page and understand that it's attributed to him again and again and again in the actual pamphlet literature. And of course, um, when, you, when you buy these things, this, you, can get, you can get these other abolitionist pamphlets. So uh, fast forward all the way for our conclusion to 1795. Here's our London committee continuing to publish their circulars. And they say, we cannot well restrain, refrain from informing our numerous friends that the aversion which many in this country have shown from the use of West India produce has given so much encouragement to the culture and importation of East India sugar as to produce ample importations of this article. And we are of opinion that during the continuance of the slave trade, a decided preference should be given to East India sugar. So all the way now in 95, they're not actually saying boycott, the word boycott's not invented yet, but they're, they're not saying boycott, but they're, they're moving you strongly in that direction. And, um, Clarkson writes to Phillips also in 95 and says, we should leave off everything, 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 everything. It's time to put the pressure on, not just sugar, not just rum, leave off everything. Let's turn the screws. Doesn't happen. And um, Coleridge in 95 and a speech that he makes um, uh, published in 96, he uses the rhetoric 
of Fox, of the Gurney pamphlet that's, that's ubiquitous now, his, his rhetoric is essentially that of Fox. And, and this is a remarkable thing, it seems to me, not just because of Coleridge's own moral stance, but because it's become part of a common way of understanding the nature of the problem because of its wide distribution, because of its wide consumption. So how are we to understand the boycott of sugar and rum in England and to some degree in America during the mid 80s, 90s, late 90s? Is it Fox's pamphlet? Is it Gurney? Is it the agency again of multiple producers and consumers? Is it thoughts for the tea table? Is it the concatenations of pamphlets that are kind of the greatest hits? It seems to me it's all of these things. We know a great deal about the sugar boycott of 91, 92. The scholarship is exemplary. And yet the affordances of bibliography and book history when trained on this particular moment in social and political history can, I submit to you, be deeply informing. And perhaps, perhaps this could serve as a kind of test case that might encourage young historians to be trained in bibliography and book history in order to marshal their intellectual affordances to create a deeper and more complex picture of what we think we already know. Thank you very much indeed. Follow through and um, do our questions, one on the floor, one from Zoom. So first question. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. This is really great. Um, one thing that I found particularly interesting about your lecture today, building off of yesterday's, is that you're looking at not only the network of print behind abolition, but here especially how important reprinting was and reprinting provincially and um, reprinting in cheaper, shorter forms. And I'm just wondering um, if you think that this particular function of print feels correlated at all to whiteness? Um, because I'm interested if in if Equiano or other black voices were ever printed, reprinted to this extent and got this sort of repetition and um, this proliferation of print. And I'm just wondering like if there is a discrepancy, if you have any thoughts about that. And thank you so much again. <laughs> thank you, it's an interesting question. Um, Equiano, of course, does get reprinted after his death in 1825 um, in, in one of these concatenation books. But, um, but it's also true that I think that there's a, a moral reason not for reprinting Equiano in his lifetime, which is that he's supporting his wife and family by issuing a series of subscriptions. So for instance, he goes to Dublin which is a great center of reprinting and excerpting, right? He goes to Dublin, he lives among the people in Dublin, he holds meetings in Dublin, he makes speeches in Dublin, as Frederick Douglass will do um, in the next century in order to sell his book. So, so this, becomes, this becomes really important, it seems to me, and gives a, a, a moral reason why you wouldn't want to reprint Equiano's interesting narrative because you would be taking revenue away from a man who's supporting himself by the power of his pen. And as I adverted to, I think by his um, moral authority and charisma as well. So I think that may be part of it, um, but, but your question is provocative and, and, and is going to, to send me thinking. So thank you. We have a similar question from the chat. Um, Despite having been a friend of Equiano and a subscriber to multiple copies of his first edition, as well as having been instrumental in Equiano's creation of the author's book tour, why do you think Clarkson overlooks in his history Equiano's contributions to the abolitionist cause? Yeah, there's, 
That's a lovely question and a, and a deeply provoking one. Um, first of all, it's true that Clarkson wrote in tremendous haste. That's not to exculpate him in any way, but but he he publishes the he publishes the history with with great rapidity. He wants to capitalize on it. So so one could say that he has the committee documents by his side, which he clearly does, and he um, and he's writing fast. I don't think that's the whole answer, though. I think part of the answer is that um, the hero of the history is Clarkson. And, um, and of course, Wedgwood's sons come after Clarkson hard for making himself the protagonist of the history in many ways and not Wedgwood. And there's a kind of a pamphlet war back and forth about who, who's the real hero of abolition. And this is a problem, right? Because the Africa Society is being formed and they have phase two of their program. They need to abolish the slave trade, uh, slavery and not just the slave trade. And there's this kind of um, uh, family feud that, that detracts, it seems to me, from their effectiveness for quite some time. Um, I don't know. I think that that Equiano's interesting narrative, uh, published by himself, controlled by himself, the profits only for himself, not reprinted, uh, becomes a kind of a sui generis phenomenon that it's easy for other abolitionists to sequester. I, I don't think that that redounds well to their to our assessment of their moral fiber. But I do think that that's the case again and again. There seems to be a kind of a partitioning that um, that seems easy to do, and um, it's also true that uh, Equiano, in in the interesting narrative, never advocates explicitly for the abolition of the slave trade, and never ab advocates explicitly for the boycott of sugar and rum very, very careful. And I think that that, that um, carefulness in the way he constructs his autobiographical novel uh, uh, narrative um, is, is to, to uh, it's because it's deeply informed by the lack of success of his, his friend and fellow son of Africa, um, Kuguano. He sees what Kuguano's book has done and um, he tries to do the opposite. And, and, and that doesn't fully answer the, the questioner's um, uh, query, but I think, it's, I think it's an important aspect of it. There is a partitioning, there's no question. But in Clarkson's defense, it's not specifically a piece of abolitionist literature. Just like yesterday, I adduced um, the, the runaway success of the subscription of Ignatius Sancho's letter. It's not explicitly a piece of abolitionist literature, but it figures prominently into the abolitionist conversation because of how cultured and stylish um, and, and inculturated uh, Sancho is. And so, um, yeah, it raises, uh, the question raises some important moral problems, I think. Michael, this is more maybe of an economic question than a bibliographical question, but I wonder if there is bibliographical evidence that the boycott worked. So that economic chain from the tea table all the way back to the sugar plantation, was the boycott of 300 some odd thousand people not using sugar and rum enough to impose economic pain throughout that chain? Um, I don't know. I do know that the boycott seems to have been enough. Correlation is not a cause, but it seems to have been enough to scare the West Indian planters in London to increase the tax on their members and to use that revenue to embark on a publishing program, which I'll dilate upon on Thursday. And so were they feeling the pinch already? Probably not because the market was so huge. Um, 300,000 doesn't seem like enough to cause economic harm to the principles. 
Um, but did it have the potential to get bigger? And did they, did they believe they needed to spend money and time and effort to be a countervailing force to a tide that was rising fast? Absolutely. All right, from the chat. Um, the bookseller Joseph Johnson appeared in imprints of some of the books you presented. What role, if any, did he play in the abolitionist slash boycott movement? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. Um, he, he certainly he's certainly one of the one of the goodies. You know, he seems to be one of the people who's who's trying to move abolitionist printed uh, printed matter forward. And yet, there are only shockingly there are only three publishers who during the long 20 years of abolition only published pro, who published in any significant numbers, only published pro-abolition pamphlets and never published something on the other side. Phillips is one, Gurney is another, and I forget who the third is. Now some um, like uh, Debrett, as we'll see on Thursday, he's just publishing pro-slavery stuff left, right, and center. Um, but but some are mostly one side, but occasionally are in an imprint as sellers. They're not probably publishers, and here we should probably um, uh, look at the the very fine small uh, essay called The Meaning of Imprint by David Foxen uh, to try to understand what, what an imprint actually means. But um, I, I think that there are certainly people who are selling both kinds of pamphlets. Are they, it's a very much of the moment. Are they trying to drive traffic into their shops? Very probably. Are they trying to balance a contentious and divided public? Quite possibly. Are, are, they, um, are some of the pro-abolitionist publisher or booksellers um, uh, vending material from the other side because it's a volatile time and, and uh, the, the consumer public is, is afraid because of the French Revolution, because of the Haitian Revolution? Uh, quite probably. Uh, so it's a complicated, it's a complicated thing. I, in my naivete, I, in the beginning of this enterprise many years ago, would look at an imprint and say, aha, that must be uh, a pamphlet that has this stance because I recognize this bookseller's name in the imprint and therefore not so. Not so, that's, um, that's a specious argument. You have to go read the pamphlet and you also have to understand that there are, there's a profit motive, but there are other political valences at work that we might not be able fully to recover. Um, so, so Johnson is definitely um, tending much more toward the abolition side, uh, but, but even Johnson, uh, in, in my recall, and there are a lot of publishers and a lot of pamphlets, um, about 30,000. Uh, even Johnson is uh, works both sides of the street a little bit. Thanks, Michael, for another wonderful lecture. I was trying to think about what, well, just take the image that's up there. And so many of these images you've shown say at the bottom, price one pence or 14 for a shilling. One actually said 100 for three shillings and sixpence. Now, this is the same period as your last lecture was talking about the opposite, is that the move was from pamphlets to books. And so in the same period, you're looking at bigger and bigger things being done on the official scale that you were looking at. And you said by the, as I'm recalling, 1790 to 1792, there are virtually no pamphlets. The vast majority are going into books, which are going up market. And it really strikes me that this is, you know, that. Martha Gurney actually says at one point, and one of the things you showed, a trivial price. But what you're looking at is amazing. It's often less than a halfpenny. Yeah. And I'm presuming that is what is, do you have any evidence about how these are being distributed in churches, in meeting houses, in lectures, 
I'm thinking particularly of these lectures which are being uh, announced, you know, all of these lectures. So are people actually going with a hundred of them that they've bought themselves, you know, and distributing? And there you'd be looking at a kind of new moral community of people thinking of themselves as they need to participate, not just individually by subscribing, but by actually buying them by the hundred or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... It's an interesting question that, that you raised yesterday, Peter, about this, this distribution of free print versus distribution of print. You know, I know, I know that um, there are a number of studies uh, in which you charge, if you charge a little bit for, for uh, print, people then tend to read it. If you just give it to them, then they throw it out. Um, so uh, it's hard to know. Uh, Wedgwood very tellingly talks about the hawkers and the hawkers have to get their due and has to sell for a price. So he's not saying I'm going to print a thousand of these and give them away and encourage others to do the same. He says, I'm going to print a thousand of these. I'll absorb the cost and I'm going to make sure that the hawker gets his bit so that it's worth his while to be the agent of distribution. Right, because I can't just stand on a street corner. I need somebody to go out and and so it, it's um, the valences are not always straightforward. But you you know and I know that um, just from the imprints we were seeing, they are being distributed at meeting houses. They are being distributed in churches. They are being because the because the imprints tell us so. Um, and, and they're also, uh, until the franking privilege is, is obliterated, they're also using the franking privilege to get these through the post. And, and that seems to me really important as well. We have a lot of great questions in the chat, but I think we only have time for one more. One or two. Um, did anyone attempt to enforce literary pro property rights over any of these texts or even to assert such rights. It seems to me that doing so would run contrary to their purposes that anti-slave trade campaigners would welcome unauthorized editions. Yes, that's exactly right. The, the questioner's reading is exactly right. I know of no, no case uh, where someone says, wait a minute, your summary view basically is taking away from my original pamphlet, not at all. Or even, wait a minute, you reprinted this in the provinces? You printed this in Hull and I'm Martha Gurney in, in London? How dare, nothing like that. I can't find a single trace. They're not interested in their intellectual property. They're interested in, in flooding, flooding the, the reading public with, with a very um, pointed moral argument. Their, their goal is not primarily uh, fame or profit, their goal is, is, is political and moral change. Uh, and, and that seems to me really uh, important, both in the conduct of the abolition societies themselves. Uh, the only instance I know in which there's some evidence of contestation for the modification of a slave uh, trade and abolitionist pamphlet is um, the, the slave ship Brooks when it's improved from 1,200 to 2,400 words. And when it goes from one uh, diagram to seven diagrams, when it's improved by that committee of five members of the London committee, the Plymouth committee says, kind of could have given us a little notice that you were doing this and you kind of could have given us a little credit for being the originators of this and you just kind of took it and made it your own and you know what are we chop liver and um and that's the only instance i know uh and and in fact one of the things that the the Plymouth committee does when they reprint their version is they then steal the london seal Am I not a man and a brother? And without asking any permission, they put it on their pamphlet. So there's a kind of a little bit of a tit for tat there. But that, I mean, nobody's talking about making money. Nobody's talking about intellectual property. They're talking about courtesy. They're talking about having been given a heads up really more than any, and an acknowledgement, I think. Um, but that's the only instance I know of. But the, the questioner is exactly right. I think, I think somebody like Fox, who goes on to have a really important 
political career, a pamphleteering career, um, uh, highly critical of the government again and again. Um, and he's a fearless pamphleteer. Uh, he wants to be reprinted. He wants his ideas disseminated. And so I think everybody knows they have carte blanche to do this, and so they do. Michael, thanks so much. This is dazzling and there's so much going by. Um, I just wanted to come back to the first night and, and tonight to, uh, um, and your, these wonderful two protagonists, um, Phillips and Gurney, and your remarks at the end about broadening our methodologies. And maybe you could just talk for another minute about on the, how on the one hand we have, you have so many documents from the committees, so many letters, you know, even Wedgwood, of course, you have to go back to the original to see the real letter. And then there are these characters who are so crucial to your story, Phillips, Gurney, and we and you have a kind of nothing on the one hand and a kind of everything in the imprints. So how, if I can turn this into a question, how do we tell the stories of these printers? You're trying to tell us that we need to, and you're doing it so well. And I just, I would like your methodological thoughts on those names and imprints that we want to know so much about and you're telling us is so crucial to these stories. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's good scholarship on Gurney that, that's come out in the last, since 2006 or so. And, um, and that really centers her in the Maze Pond congregation. And um, that's been enormously valuable to me. So there's, there's more on Gurney than there is on Phillips, it seems to me. Um, ironically, Phillips's mother is in the ODNB, actually his stepmother, because she was a uh, traveling Quaker preacher in, in the United States, in the colonies. And, and uh, Phillips has a son who's in the ODNB because he was an important scientist. But Phillips is only mentioned in the ODNB in the summary article on the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, which is a beautifully written inspectus. But, but only that. And um, he seems to have been elided from history in, in some uh, important, uh, in some significant ways. And I, I don't know if that's because he's a tradesman, uh, but I think that that work of historical recovery is really important and um, don't know how far I'll get, but I'm trying to hoover up every scrap of paper that's addressed to him and, and that's, that's written by him. Uh, because I'd like to try to reconstruct something of his business. Uh, I had to go fast at the end yesterday, but I don't know if you saw the slide, which was prepared by a graduate student of mine who is quite brilliant, Michael Von Hoos, who deserves great thanks. And he put the blue for the, he knew how to display the information in a way that I didn't. Um, so full credit to Michael. Uh, the abolitionist printing was, was in the blue and his total output in that kind of histogram was, was in the gray behind it. And you see the total output from, from uh, 1775 to 1799, even though he had a series of strokes during his career um, uh, is vast. He's, he's running a huge business. And, and among other things, he's not just printing for the abolitionists, he's printing for the Quakers. And I've been able to document his, his annual revenue from Quaker printing, but he's also printing for a number of charitable societies. Uh, it's also true that he's a trustee of an important charitable trust. He seems to be someone who people relied on. And so, so his networks are, are vast. They're, they're informed by religion, they're informed by charity, but they're, but they're also informed by, I think, his, his reliability as, a, as an effective node in multiple networks. And, and I, would, I, I, I hope in future, um, uh, should I live, um, to be able to do, to do more on Phillips. And I hope more on Gurney and more on this notion of the provincial networks um, uh, that are so important and, and uh, have really been understudied. And when one thinks about the survival rates of provincial 
printed matter as being significantly lower because provincial matter was not collected at the same rate. The importance of collecting comes to the fore here. Provincial matter, small print runs, often less high production value and was not collected by mainstream cultural institutions at the times of their founding and was not collected by major collectors on either side of the Atlantic by and large. Why? Because, because it wasn't sexy. It had no, you know, it was, it was um, ephemera in many ways. And so I, I, I feel certain that the, there's more out there, but I also feel certain that the historical record um, has been impoverished by the ravages of time which is no surprise to any of you here. With that, we'd like to thank Michael and um, for his lecture tonight and look forward to hearing the conclusion on Thursday night. I'll give you a round of applause. Thank you.